are intrigued and interested in doing um, three things. One is community. We want to introduce you to people in our community. And so today we have two amazing people um, that we love that we're excited to hear from. So we want to do that, introduce you to them, um, maybe introduce you to, to other people that you can get to know and have intentional and meaningful conversations. Um, so that community part. And then the second one is conversations. And just, um, so you're gonna, we're gonna hear from our hosts today, but then we're also gonna go into breakout rooms um, with just a few people where we can have intentional, meaningful conversations with one another around the Enneagram and around yeah. mental health. Um, and so I'm really excited for that piece. If that makes you a little nervous, if that freaks you out and you're like, nope, I'm out at that part, I really encourage you stay. That, in our April series, that was the part that people were like, that, part alone we would stay for. We would come back to that piece because even though it's a little intimidating at, at first, um, there's something really special about getting to do that with other people and have kind of a dialogue with them. So community conversations, and then we always end with a commission. So something that you can do um, in the coming week, maybe in the coming weeks, um, that will um, just help move you forward from wherever you are today in your journey um, and kind of help you move forward and take those next steps. So Amanda, I'm like I said, I'm Beth. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Bone and Marrow Market. Amanda is another co-founder and she's going to introduce our hosts for today and we'll get rolling. Yeah, so I'm really excited to get to introduce um, Jennifer and Cameron. Um, I actually get to work alongside of Jennifer in another capacity, in another, in another um, uh, opportunity that I get to do during the week. And, and I love that you what, had to think about what to call it. I, well, I'm like, what do I call it? Um, we work together in another capacity, um, but on more than one occasion, she has um, just been so refreshing to listen to um, just when I've had something I don't understand or when I've had something um, that I'm struggling with and it's just been really sweet. So I'm excited to get to introduce them today to you. Um, Cameron Clark, who is um, the co-host for this, um, has been um, a student and a teacher of the Enneagram since 2017. He's got a degree in philosophy and religion from Martin Methodist. And he serves in a church setting as a worship leader, a middle school director, an adult educator. Um, he's personally experienced the transformative work of the Enneagram and shares his knowledge through small groups and classes. So we're excited to have him and Jen today, who is an ordained pastor and graduate of Vanderbilt Divinity School. And she spent two decades um, counseling, teaching, studying, and exploring how God's uniquely designed each of us. Um, she is passionate about questions, journeys, personality, and exploring God's movement and work in the world with others. And the Enneagram has been a tool I think that she uses often. I know she's used it with me, and so we're excited to have them. And we will turn this session over to them. Man, you know, when you say uh, for two decades she's been counseling and working with people, that is like a terrifying way to phrase that. I think I actually told you you can say that, and then it's terrifying to hear. I'm so excited to be here, guys. I want to go ahead and start our conversation and jump right in. I know that when Amanda said, hey, would you be interested in talking about the Enneagram with the bone and marrow audience? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, what are you thinking? And we sent, we sent them a list of maybe ideas to kind of zero in because they've had a great series, the Enneagram and creativity, the Enneagram and spiritual disciplines, the Enneagram and marriage, the Enneagram and work. I mean, like there's, they've just really taken it and uh, made it really applicable and brought in some great speakers. And, and so she said, what about Enneagram and mental health? And I thought, that's great. I can talk about that for, you know, for days on end. And she goes, well, you've got about 20 minutes. <laughs> so we're going to, in 20 minutes, somehow have a conversation about something that is this, that is this massive tool. And, and there's a couple of things I think that are important when we, before we even really begin. I mean, one, this conversation is going to be limited, right? Because for me, at least the Enneagram is a tool that we use, but it doesn't encompass all of mental health. I mean, there's genetics. We've got some biology stuff going on. We've got some extreme trauma, even beyond something like a childhood wound. I mean, we've got some things that I, I'm not quite sure fit into the spectrum of the Enneagram. And I don't know that the Enneagram expects itself to be a catch-all. For, for both Cam and I, I know we're really passionate about making sure people uh, look at the Enneagram as a tool, um, not as a toy. You're going to hear us talk about that a little bit. But before we jump in, I'm really going to let Cam kind of kick it off because we're going to look at it in two components. I want to look at the validity 
of the Enneagram as a tool in mental health. So if you happen to be an Enneagram coach or you're a counselor or you're someone who spends a lot of time teaching and guiding people, I wanna, I wanna earn uh, your respect for this tool and, and, and hopefully give you some pieces and some, some guidance on how you can incorporate that into your practice, whether you're an individual or someone leading others. But Cam's gonna really give you the how to apply this tool and we're gonna jump into that. But I did tell Cam I wanted to, to start with a conversation a little bit about the season that we're in. So I, I wasn't aware until Amanda and Bethany told me that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So, um, but I have been struck lately uh, and had lots of conversations with people who, because of the particular season we're in, are kind of having a hard time figuring out what's going on with their mental health. And I think that there's a lot of layers to that, right? But one of the things that kind of struck me the other day was when there is an issue or a crisis, we usually band together. Like, so if there's a tornado, we actually usually come together as a community and we respond. If there's a hurricane, we all come together for relief. If there's a, tra a trauma in our family, we even, you know, we come together. Uh, and then we get active, right? We make meals, we, we help someone, we serve someone, we, we, we take them water, we do clean up efforts. But what's interesting about COVID-19 and shelter in place and all the things that we're dealing with right now is it almost pushes you toward isolation. Um, you're almost required, right? to be isolated, which is a very different way to operate in a time of crisis or a time of struggle. And I don't think we're meant to be isolated. I think we're not really wired to be fully isolated and to operate through struggle in isolation. And so what I'm noticing is a lot of people are feeling just something and they really can't name it. I know for me a couple of days ago, my husband just looked at me and he was like, what's wrong with you? Because uh, I was really short with my kids, I have two teenage boys and I was, I was just super fractious with them. And it took me a couple of days to realize that for me in particular, and I can go ahead and tell you, I'm, a, I'm an Enneagram one. And so, you know, with my personality, I'm looking for the right information and I'm okay with kind of whatever the information is. I just need it to be the truth and I need it to be, to have integrity and I need it to be accurate. And so when, can, when information is all over the place, it causes confusion for me. And so there's just this been stuff bubbling up in me. And I think that I, I want to make sure that we kind of give voice to that right out of the gate. And because I think that maybe there's others out there that are feeling these things. And I know that we're going to see some mental health issues spike up. I, I even had a conversation last night with someone who had uh, a friend in California whose friend had taken their life, a 30 year old woman and just very overwhelmed and people aren't gonna be able to name it. So one of the things I hope we can take from this conversation is an ability to help people give voice to where they may be feeling isolated and, and also just kind of the, the repercussions of that isolation and the confusion in the season we're in. But I think the reality is when we all join in on an Enneagram conversation, I, I had two texts today uh, about what number do you think I am? I saw that you're gonna have this conversation about the Enneagram, what number do you think I am? Um, and the more like dogmatic they were, I was like, you might be an eight, you're a little pushy. I'm just teasing, totally kidding for anyone that's an eight. But I know that that's kind of what we want to know. So I'm gonna let Cam kind of jump in there, even though realizing we've got some limitations around this dialogue and we don't want to um, over stereotype any numbers or personalities. But I know that one of the most often questions Cam and I get is, so do you think certain numbers are prone to certain things? Are all twos codependent? Um, do all ones end up getting OCD? Are all uh, eights aggressive? Are all fours depressed? I could keep going, but I'm going to let Cam kind of talk a little bit about how that might unfold. All right. So uh, I'm going to open with in the wisdom of the Enneagram, which is uh, Don Riso and Russ Hudson's book. He actually does list a uh, category of like warning signs of if you're in a very unhealthy state of your type, you're more likely to develop symptoms of certain uh, mental disorders. So ones would be OCD, twos are histrionic personality disorder, uh, type three is narcissistic personality disorder, type four is severe depression, type five schizoid uh, or avoidant personality disorders, type six is paranoid, dependent or borderline with anxiety. Uh, that's true. Um, <laughs> I just, Cam, can I stop you for just, just because I'm watching people's faces and every time, I think I can tell people's numbers by, uh, no, like the, 
So there's there's a spectrum of help on the Enneagram. Yeah, there's the wisdom, like this visceral reaction. The or, the Enneagram, there is nine, there's like nine levels of help. And this is like bottom tier. But, and this doesn't take into account uh, like chemical imbalances, that sort of thing. Um, you can you can be a two with an anxiety disorder. You know, it's it's not necessarily uh, correlated. These are just symptomatology based off of uh, the maximum compulsion of your type, I guess would be a way to say it. So eights is anti-social, uh, sevens is manic depressive, uh, and nine is disassociative or dependent uh, disorder. So I just want to get that out of the way because I know a lot of people, we all jump through, uh, when we start Enneagram books, we generally jump to our type, I imagine. I think most people do that. Uh, the book I'm reading now, uh, Chris Ewers just released a new book, and he purposefully made it to where it's not, you can't jump to type. It's all intermingled, which I actually kind of, okay. mm -hmm. uh, but so I'm going to talk about it being a cure or a tool. So the Enneagram is more than just a list of traits. So uh, usually when, especially when we first start, we just read our traits list top to bottom. And usually that's how we find ourselves. We see the negative and the stuff that really gets our ego uncomfortable. Um, but ultimately it's more than just that list. It's actually a tool for growth. Uh, the idea is that with the Enneagram, if you're unfamiliar, we, that we've over-identified with certain fragments of our uh, personality or our whole selves, and that creates our personality. So we lose touch or we lose faith with our true self and develop a false self as a stand-in. And that's a uh, language taken from Thomas Merton, who's a monk. Uh, the Enneagram is kind of a tool to help us wake up to those parts of ourselves that we've tried to jettison or put in a category of not me, which I'll get into later. Um, but as great as it is, it's not a silver bullet. So there's several ways, or about three, when me and Jen talk about the Enneagram, we've kind of narrowed it down to three ways that we see the Enneagram being used most often. Um, the first is uh, that it's trivial or a toy. And we see this a lot in um, kind of just the culture on social media, which I think is just inherent and in that's, you know, it has to be part of that because it has to be appealing to the masses. But it's just another online quiz or, you know, we always joke around like, what's your Disney princess or whatever it is. Uh, and it was used as a parlor trick. So I've gotten asked several times, oh, you know the Enneagram, what's my type? And I'm like, I'm not comfortable answering that question. I don't know you. Um, <laughs> But I think the problem with that kind of uh, social media culture is that it actually makes us complacent uh, to the actual growth work that it takes. Like for me, it's like, oh, I'm just a six, so I'm anxious. Or, you know, how to of me, you know, it's, it becomes a descriptor and it doesn't promote the growth that it can or because there is no, because there's no responsibility to do the actual work and it makes our personalities seem like a fixed set of traits uh, instead of a dynamic interplay between kind of our type, our wings, our you know stress and security points, our intelligence centers, like there's this whole dynamic color wheel at play here. And if if it's just a list of types or traits, then uh, we're missing the point. So the second is the other end of the you know the, the extreme here. It's the other polarity, is that we it becomes an idol, uh, or idol's a hard word, but it's that we white knuckle the caricatures of our type so much that it actually begins to reinforce our fixations or our compulsions, right? So we get so identified with those traits, even though we know what it is, that we become our type. And the important thing to remember is that you're more than your type. So uh, the way that me and Jen have come to describe it is kind of a tool. There's a middle ground between these extremes where it, it serves as not a silver bullet, but a tool to help us move towards wholeness, and compassion for ourselves and for others. So understanding our Enneagram type is a starting point to understanding who we are, but it's not the whole of who we are. So, uh, so my experience is I've always been an anxious person. Uh, I've always had a lot of, you know, even though I play music for churches, I play music for churches all the way back to middle school for some reason. I hate being in front of people, but so, and, and I'm doing this, I don't know, uh, but, <laughs> And then several years ago, after my, uh, my now five-year-old was born, uh, I developed an actual anxiety disorder, which it just went from here to there. You know what I mean? So I basically became a hermit, panic attacks all the time, uh, lost a ton of weight. But I started therapy, which helped a lot. And then I started medication. And then I read a ton 
of books about anxiety and beating anxiety and what that looks like and biographies and all the stuff. And then I transitioned from uh, meditation to contemplative prayer, which is basically the same thing with just some spiritual undertones. And then, uh, but as I was climbing out of that anxiety, I found the Enneagram. And what that did was kind of give me a new level of understanding about who I was, what I was going through. And years later, now, I'm still naturally anxious. This uh, freaked me out doing this. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, and this is one of my jobs, is speak, speaking in front of people and playing music in front of people, which I still have a love-hate relationship. But I have a larger pool of resources to draw from now than I did before. So by holding that mirror to all of my compulsions and fixations and my good traits and bad traits and all these different things, uh, and going back into the childhood wound, if you're unfamiliar with the Enneagram, that's going to be confusing. But, you know, it built this base and then it gave me other paradigms or other lenses to look through. So I thought that was really important. So with that, I'm going to kick that back to Jen. Yeah, I love, Kim, thanks for sharing, honestly, you know, about your own stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm listening to you and I'm just thinking about uh, the, the origination of this whole tool, right? And there's, that's, there's, it's debatable, right, where this even comes from. You know, is it from the Desert Fathers? Is it, is it from the Sufis? Like, where, where has this thing evolved from? And then we've added layers even to this ancient way of viewing personality. And we've added some pop psychology to it. And we, we brought it over here in the U.S. In the, in the 70s. I'm not sure that was the best time to bring it over, but we did, you know. And, and, but the, the, or, or it was the perfect time. I, I do think, um, I find it very interesting that it's originally not supposed to be taught. Like you're not supposed to have quizzes and you're not supposed to write books about it, right? It's supposed to be passed down from spiritual director to spiritual director. And, and I remember being in school and taking you know, counseling classes and there are several things they taught us and they would look at us and say, but you don't teach this. They would say, you take this and you use it with your clients or you use it with your parishioners, but you don't tell them what you're doing. And, and, as I mean, for me, I felt like that's just deceptive and silly. Like, why, why would we not just go ahead and have everyone do all these things and understand what they are? Getting down the road, I mean, and I did that at first. I got out of grad school, started meeting with people, and I was like, everybody's going to fill out a genogram. This is like what I made everybody do for a big chunk of time because it's like a psychological family tree, and it was beneficial for me. So sure, it'll, it'll be beneficial for everyone. And over time, I realized, like, it, it's not that those things are secret because there's something wrong or even mysterious about them, but, but when we bring them out and we, we kind of simplify them in a package format, we remove the work. And, I, uh, you know, even talking to someone today in a text message about what kind of number do you think I am, and the way they were looking at their number was how everyone else sees them and views them, and they were kind of missing the component that was, like, this is a work for you to do. So the, the passage I always use, this is like my Enneagram verse. And obviously that's my background, but you know, Psalm 139 says, I knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and I know that full well. And I think that we don't know that full well. We don't take a lot of time. We don't do a lot of self-care, so we don't do a lot of reflection. Uh, we struggle with meditation. It's not easy for most of us. So we don't take the time to sit and to really unravel how God has knit us together. And, and I'm just as guilty of that. You know, I love that Cam said when he started to experience anxiety. He, you know, he went and he got counseling. He tried some medication. I was uh, totally a quick fix person. I remember going to my doctor and saying, hey, I'm really struggling with my moods. Something's really off. And she said, well, okay. I mean, I came to her because I'd seen a commercial about a pill I could take. And I already had the pill written on a piece of paper for her. I was like, I just need you to give me this pill. And she goes, well, I, I can do that. Or you could maybe make sure you're getting some sleep, cut back on sugar, increase your vitamin D and B. And I was like, oh, I'll take the pill. I wanted, I wanted the quick way out. I didn't want to do the work. And so when you start talking about the Enneagram and mental health, I think it's such a valid tool, but it takes work. And so we miss it when we just say, we, you know, if we were to go into therapy and they were to give us a quiz and they were to say, hey, well, you're this we would do what Cam's talking about. We would press into that type and we would miss the opportunity to work on it. I mean, there's this, um, this blessing and this curse that comes with our type and our gift is wrapped up in our struggle. And we want to separate those. We want to see a list of weaknesses and a list of strengths. 
And I love how modern day psychology and, and historically psychology and spirituality were enmeshed. These things weren't separate. Uh, they didn't view them in two different worlds, right? This all kind of wove together, but we've taken it and we said, well, here's church or spirituality or faith or meditation. And here's mental health, psychology, and the other soft sciences. And I, I mean, think that we, together. yeah, every, everything goes together historically, but now we're, we're doing this. And then what's funny is I have a quote from someone who's helped, he's helping to formulate the DSM. So the DSM is the diagnostic manual for mental Ill illnesses and mental disorders. But he says this, and this is a quote, his name is, huh? It's his interpretation. He says, the most central, memorable, and knowable element of any person, he's defining that as personality, still defies consensus, meaning, we still don't understand it. So we've got this big book of all this mental health, all these mental health disorders, their attributes, treatment plans, um, but we still have this thing called personality that we've allowed to stand outside of it. And I think that when, when Amanda said, what about Enneagram and mental health? Like if I could give any picture, it would be, I think it's time to say personality is a factor in our mental health. Um, and if we do the work to press into it and learn it more, we'll discover more about ourselves. I don't think it solves all of our mental health issues, but it absolutely opens our eyes to things that we might be predisposed to and gives ourselves grace and gives us grace for others as well. Kim, you had, you had a thought you wanted to share. Oh, uh, so there's a book I've been reading on um, called Nine Lenses on the World by Dr. Jerry Wagner, who kind of tries to take, uh, he's a PhD psychotherapist, used to be a, I think he was a Jesuit priest, which was like when they first brought it over, the Jesuits were the first ones that learned it. Um, but he has, uh, he says that everybody has a defense mechanism that serves as a buffer between what he calls the me category, which is everything that we see as like our good traits, right? So all the things like I'm a sick, so I'm loyal, I'm responsible of all these things. We put them all over here. And then we take all those things that we don't like, which is usually the opposite of those, that are still us, and we put them over in this category, right? Which is not me. And we try to disavow those, we repress them, we jettison them. But unfortunately, uh, what happens when we uh, repress traits is they just stay, right? We can't get rid of them. And they fester, generally. Uh, and they grow. And uh, one thing in the new book, uh, The Enneagram of Belonging, he talks about it as our inner dragon, right? So we, uh, dragons usually guard treasure, which is like our essence. But they also, uh, sometimes they serve as messengers. It can be a tool to get us back on the right track. And sometimes they serve as monsters. And when we put them in our shadow and we let them grow, they become these big monsters that kind of uh, start directing how we live. So uh, what we're talking about, well, I'll give some examples real quick. So threes, uh, I'm just going to use three, six, and nine, because they're kind of the center of their instinctive centers or intelligence centers, if you're under, familiar with triads. But so threes use identification as their defense mechanism, which they identify with their role as successful in order to avoid the experience of or the appearance of failure, because the important part of the three is the is, even more than success is the appearance of success, right? So sixes, uh, me, use projection. So they actually take either their negative attributes or their fears or you know insecurities and they project them onto other people. And then that way, you know, they can deal with them out there and not deal with them in here, right? And then nines use narcotization, which is they numb themselves to both internal and external external conflicts because they don't they don't like the conflict, right? They have to mediate it. So what the Enneagram does is it actually serves as a mirror, right? It holds it up. So you have to see those parts of yourselves that you've hidden into your shadow. Because if it's in the shadow, it's your blind spot. It's back here with that stormtrooper helmet back there. It's back here. You can't see it, right? And it grows and it directs you and you don't realize it does. So those parts of us that we've tried to repress are still there. And the Enneagram says, hey, you still have to deal with these things. You're just not, and now you have this automated series of responses, like a computer, that you hit, and you think you're being autonomous, but you're not. You're just running on tracks. So the, um, those parts of us that we try to repress, we have to see. We have to learn to hold the tension between that me side over here, right, and the not me side. And there's a tension there, and that's sort of, to use religious language, that's the cross we have to bear. And to realize that everything belongs, 
And uh, we have to develop, most importantly, uh, self-compassion, right? Uh, most of us have inner critics, especially ones. I know sixes do. I imagine a lot of other types have the, that constant chatter, right, that's always in the back of your mind. And what? Right? No, what? Uh, so with the Enneagram, and this is where like spiritual practices or just meditation or yoga or something that gives you an, uh, an inner witness that gives you a little bit of space between your inner critic and your actual thought process and realize what's true and what's not comes in. Uh, that's another conversation. But, um, you know, we have to develop that self-compassion to realize we are the whole of ourselves, whether we want to be or not. And this section of the me is just important as this section of the not me. And we have to bring those together for wholeness, right? Because we've uh, over identified with this fragment of ourselves and created this false personality of like everything I want to be. And that creates this, you know, endless cycle that we're stuck in, which is called fixation and passion and all this Enneagram language, which read books. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of good, and there's, uh, I think they're going to share a, um, a list of resources that me and Jen have pulled from and books that we recommend uh, that if you guys want to click on those, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But to end my section, um, this morning when I was studying for this, because uh, I read a stupid amount, because I was so nervous about this, uh, that I, I pulled uh, out The Wisdom of the Enneagram, which is one of the, like, the second book I think I read on it. And I read a part that I missed somehow before, which is putting it all into practice, right? So there's seven steps to how to integrate the Enneagram into uh, self-compassion, which is what we're talking about when we talk about mental health and self-care self and all these things. So number one is seeking truth, which is not being afraid of recognizing those parts of yourself that you don't want to identify with. It's accepting those. Because if you don't accept them, they're gonna stay in your shadow and they're just gonna stay there because they don't go anywhere. Um, number two is learning how to not do, right? We're human beings. We wanna, we're always like ready to go. We're always doing stuff, but it's learning to let go of some of our oughts and shoulds, which are generally generated from our uh, personality and not our whole self. Um, number three is a willingness to be open, which is allowing both the me and the not me to reside and realizing that to be, I guess, become whole, those parts have to be recognized and accepted, um, sometimes reframed. Uh, four is get proper support. So therapy is great. Uh, it helped me out a lot. Uh, having confidants that aren't going to just blab and you know gossip about everything you told them is good. Spiritual directors are good if you're into that sort of thing. Um, five, well, not everybody's religious, Jen. Get that face out of here. Uh, this is true. That's cool. You can have spiritual direction and actually not be religious. Just mm -hmm. gonna distinction, yeah. you know. That's true. There. Solitude, silence, and stillness are all good regardless of whether or not you're religious. Uh, what Jim did is called reaction formation, which is the defense mechanism for one. Um, so uh, number five is learn from everything, which means to try to stay present to just the moment. So a lot of people, um, you know, if you're in a dark season, which we're kind of in a weird season now, like Jen talked about, mm -hmm. we try to, uh, you know, either push to the, the for you know, to the future and be like, man, when I get out of here, there's so many things I'm going to do. You know, we, we, there's things that kind of the sorrow of the moment can teach you. Uh, one of our teachers that we like, Richard Rohr, was like, you know, you don't move past the sin until it's taught you what it needs to teach you. Like, if you just get rid of it and jettison it, it's actually, you, it's a learning experience. So all of these feelings that you're feeling are learning experiences. So learn from everything. Uh, six, Cultivate a love of self, which includes self-acceptance, which I think is probably the most important one because uh, we don't want to accept those parts of ourselves that we don't like, right? I hate that I'm an anxious person. I hate that I want to run from things I'm scared of, right? I, I don't like that. I, I didn't want to be a six when I was reading about all these types. You know, I was like, I want to be a nine. Those guys seem pretty chill and <laughs> Sounds great to me. I don't want to be a six. They cowards, you know. But turns out I'm a six, so I have to deal with it. That's what <laughs> I started from. And I've learned a lot about leaning into that fear. You know, um, there's something to leaning into your uh, 
I guess your vices and almost figuring out what it what it's trying to teach you, if that makes sense. You know, why do fives need to hoard resources? Like, what are we doing here? You know, it's it's important to learn that because if you don't learn it, you're never going to heal and accept it. Uh, and seven is have a practice. Uh, so whether it's meditation, uh, which is good and you know can be non-spiritual, or spiritual disciplines with solitude, silence, and stillness, uh, yoga, whatever it is, I think it's. It's the intentional setting aside of time that's important. It's an intentionality to I'm going to work on this. So, uh, and super quick, uh, don't ignore your wings, your stress and security points, right? Because you're not just your type. Those, are, those serve as augmented lenses. So uh, Dr. Jerry Wagner uses the phrase lenses a lot. So when we're uh, healthy, we have objective lenses and we're seeing things as they should be or as well as we can with our own lenses. And when we're not healthy or we're in our stress point, we have uh, warped lenses and we're seeing a subjective reality, which you know, you're fitting the square peg in the round hole. It's not, we're doing whatever we can to see, but we're not seeing it. But our wings and our security points, um, and if you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with some of this language, uh, you can hit me. I'm really boring on Twitter and Instagram, but you can find me there. Um, you can message me. We can talk about it. Uh, but they serve as what Wagner calls augmenting lenses, right? So you can take off your lenses and put on these other lenses and have a different perspective on the world. And the, so you have five lenses available to you just on your basic type. So you can the more you lean into those and learn about those and understand reality as it is, you can get a more objective view of reality, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. So they get, yeah, they just give us an extra set of lenses to balance out the compulsions of our dominant type. 